While you're standing, I'm going to read the scripture, Nehemiah, the eighth verse, the ninth chapter and the tenth. Nehemiah, the eighth chapter, the ninth verse and the tenth verse. Nehemiah was the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared, for this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Last week, pastor preached a word, and it was a good word. It was a, a, a kind of jump up word. But it was also, can I be honest with you? Sometimes you hear the word on Sunday, and you're hyped, and you're excited. But then when you go and meditate on what was spoken it begins to hit you. When you get a chance to process what the Lord has said, when you start listening to the tape, you say, well, hold, wait a minute, God. But they say, wait a minute. And, and you begin to realize, like, how this is affecting your flesh begins to, if it wasn't kicking during service, your flesh begins to kick, kick after it. Your brain begins to rationalize how, well, maybe that was a little bit different than reality because my mon your Monday is just different sometimes than your Sunday. In the text here, and Pastor read how they were excited. I mean, we, we saw them say, bring the book. And we saw the preacher stand up on the pulpit. And we saw the people stand for hours as they listened to the word of God. And Pastor declared that we should develop a thing for the word. And the people in the text had a thing for the word. They were excited as the Mosaic law was opened up to them. And their understanding became open. And then Nehemiah said, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. And so now this word that they were so excited to hear has now made them, excuse me, mournful, has made them a little bit sad because they have heard the law and realized that they weren't coming up to it. And we hear the word sometimes on Sunday, but there comes a moment when I realize that the word is here and I am nowhere near there. Some Sundays I feel like I'm close. Some Sundays I realize I am far off. Most of the time it's Monday when I realize I'm a far off. When I get home and the same peace that I was supposed to have is taken away by something so small. And so I find myself needing to hear this. This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep. It says, then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. After this wonderful word last week, we did just that. We drank the sweet drink. We had our ices. We had our frozen ice cream. Had that wonderful lemonade. We had a cooler full of water. We had some good cooked food. Had some good grilled food. We ate the fat. We drank the sweets. And we thank God for the men that were on that grill. Look, we came here without food. And we left full. So they were sending portions to those whom nothing was prepared. We did everything that this scripture said to do. Why? It says, for this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow. So I say to you, sometimes a word is going to come and it's going to be hard for you. Sometimes the word that, that sends Elder Tim to a praising frenzy is the same word that, if he's not careful, could send Elder Keith into a depression. Because of looking at it and, and comparing myself to what it's saying and saying I do or don't do that. And so we find ourselves not led by necessarily the word that is preached, but how we identify with the specific thing that was preached that Sunday. Oh, if it's a word about praise and worship, Katrina might be at the top of her roof. But those who maybe feel like I can't even sing for the Lord might feel sad thinking somehow mistakenly that you have to be able to sing in order to praise and worship. 
if the word of God is about the feast of the Lord being spread, those of us who can relate by because we like to eat might be really, 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 really happy to hear that. And others may not. And we hear the, then we hear a word that says lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily beset you. And we see that word wait and look in the mirror and say, wait a minute. We're identifying with the word based on who we are rather than who he is. And so it says here, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. All pastor can do is bring you the book. He can pray for you. But the joy of the Lord is your strength. No matter how great of a pastor or a preacher comes up here, we can only give to you what the word of the Lord is saying. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The song that was sung this morning said it. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Well, okay, God, I've been saying and hearing that all my life. What does that mean? I know what it means on Sunday. How many know what that word, the joy of the Lord, means on Sunday? But sometimes by Tuesday, when we're, when we're in a situation where we feel weak, it doesn't, somehow it doesn't compute in that moment. It is because oftentimes we are waiting for something to happen. Pastor referred to it a few weeks back as a zap. Waiting for the zap to happen. That moment when everything becomes clear. That moment when everything that I failed at yesterday, I now can succeed at. That moment when all my worries are gone. For some of us, maybe we grew up in the Pentecostal church. That zap was that moment when we first spoke in tongues. But three days later. For some of us, it was that moment when we first did our holy dance. But three days later. For some of us, for me for a long time, that moment was when I got married, when I found my wife, when I didn't have to worry about lust anymore, when I had the woman that I would be with forever. And then after about three weeks. Look, don't look at her, look at me. I was still small. I was, if I be honest, I was still struggling to keep my laundry up to date. Still struggling to keep my clothes ironed. The things that the, the things that I, that I, the problems I had before my wife, she didn't magically zap them away. Oh come on now, we we we, we must. It, it must be that we haven't had our children yet. And as soon as God blesses this woman's womb, the doctor said my wife wasn't even going to be able to have children. Yet we had Samuel spoken to us before Sienna was even born. So surely, as soon as we have this first child, that's the moment. That's when everything's going to be all right. And when Sienna was born, it was magical. I mean, it was like a movie. I could hear songs. I've told you this before. I could hear songs moving in the background and everything. But then we had to buy diapers. At two, at two weeks old, I had to go to California for three weeks. Three weeks out of every month. From the time she was two weeks old till she was about a year old, I was gone for three weeks out of the month. And then Samuel was born. And once again, Samuel came in five weeks early. That surely was the zap, the miracle birth of a healthy baby born five weeks early and still just as big and bold as God made him to be. And I've experienced many, many other things that should have been a zap. We, we've all, I think most of us have acknowledged a, a wanting for a zap. We said things about my moment is coming or when I get that promotion or I'm about to blow up. <laughs> How many people know somebody that's been about to blow up for about two decades now? <laughs> Waiting for the zap. But then Pastor Preach, he said, The moment has happened. The moment happened way back at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came down and dwelled among us, inside of us, living in us. So that thing we've been waiting for, it's like the old love story. I've been waiting for you all this time, and you've been here all along, living inside of us, the Holy Spirit. So how did we miss it? I'll tell you how I missed it. I didn't understand what it meant. The joy of the Lord is my strength. So I began to study because that's how I process. That's how I process. 
we all process differently. I process by doing research. research. I'm going to be honest with you. I spent a long time researching the wrong things. I spent a long time on the internet looking up the wrong things. I spent, and, and I heard a preacher one day say, ain't nothing evil about the internet. It's just when you're using it. <laughs> and I realized I got a talent. I just need to use that for something else. And so that's what I do. I study. And then I found in here, I looked up the word joy. The joy is a feeling of great pleasure or happiness. So, okay, so the pleasure or happiness of the Lord is my strength. But what is the pleasure or happiness of the Lord? It said in Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, the 10th verse. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. And so as I begin to study, I, I realized that what pleases God, what pleased God was that Jesus would be bruised. What pleased God was that his son would come and be bruised and would die for our sins. And so I begin to take that and say, what pleases the Lord is my strength. So him being bruised is my strength. Him dying for my sins is my strength. What the things that make the Lord happy, God's will is my strength. When I find myself in the will of God, I find myself having strength. But when I find myself outside of the will of God, which is now God is God. He is, he is who he is. He cannot change, will not change for us. So he's going to stay God. And he's going to continue to have his will. We're strong-willed, but he's God. And there's a huge difference between a strong will and God. What's the difference? When you, tell, when I, when you say to me, uh, Samal, I want you to do something, and I say no, it's just me saying no. And I can fight all I want, but when I fight, it's just going to be a fight. But when God says something, it happens. If you say, Samal, that plant is all blue, and I say, no, it isn't. It's all green. That plant stay all those colors right there, and both of us wrong. But if you say to God, God, that plant's all blue. If God were to say that plant is all green, immediately we would, begin, we would see nothing but green. And unless God says anything different, it will remain green forever. We have strong will. We, we debate things, but God is God. His very word shapes things. So it is only under the will of someone whose word shapes things that we will truly find strength. That is where our covering is, in the will of God. I was talking to my wife the other day, and we were talking about just um, desires and, and wants from the Lord and desiring things from the Lord. And he reminded me of something that he shared a long time ago, that um, when we delight ourselves in the Lord, he will give us the desires of our heart. And I always thought that meant, you know, I want, let's say, I want a house and a new car. So if I desire that, I get my list to the Lord. House, new car, God. I delight myself in him. I got a house and a new car, right? But this is really what happens. I say, I write it down. Lord, I want a house and a new car. I'm going to delight myself in you. And I give him my desires. And he give it back to me. Oh, wait a minute. I say something different now. And as I delight myself in him, I begin now to desire to want the desire that he wrote down in my heart, the desire that he gave me. So when it says he will give you the desires of your heart, he is going to give you what to desire. And then when we begin to desire that, then we find strength to do that thing. Because I may not find any strength to do the thing that I want to do in my own feeble mind, but if I go to him who knows all and I delight myself in him, he's now going to give me a desire for the thing I actually am good at. Some people want to sing but can't sing very well. Some people want to dance and can't dance but can sing very well. And sometimes we might just be a little bit off with our desires. But when we, when we go to him, he begins to write into us the desires. He begins to tell us what his will is for our life. The joy of the Lord. The will of the Lord is my strength. So doing the will of the Lord gives us strength. And if we don't know the will of the Lord, then we seek him for the will he has for us in this life, in this season, 
in this assignment. And maybe my assignment in 20, our assignment for 2019 might have been just to hug somebody, just to love on somebody. I, the assignment for 2020 was to stay alive. <laughs> and sometimes it meant the things that we had the freedom to do in 2019, we didn't have the freedom to do in 2020. And now in 2021, we got an assignment to pick some people up who've been, been alone for over a year now, who haven't had a hug in over a year, who haven't seen their parents' faces in over a year. If I seek his will for me in 2018, I'm going to miss it in 2022 trying to do the 2018 thing. There's a banner up here for every year. And I'm not saying that we, we can't say God is good in 2021. But we need to be focused on God's urgency of now and 2021 because that's what he spoke to us. And in 2022, there's going to be something else coming. So it would be better if I get into the will of God's urgency of now so that when 2022 comes with its problems and its issues, I'm ready. Instead of behind. Instead of in the second grade reading at a kindergarten level. Instead of in the fifth grade and I haven't learned to read yet. Instead of in the ninth grade and I'm still struggling with pre-algebra. It looks like I'm progressing. I moved on to a new school. I'm at a new church now. I got a new pastor. This one better than the last one. So why is everything still the same? I'll tell you, for me, it's because Samal was still the same. Because the things that Samal struggled with last week to give it up to the Lord, he still struggled with this week. And then along the years, Samal picked up some new things to struggle with. But they all had the same answer. The will of the Lord for my life. Some things we have to seek him for. Some things we already know. I'm a married man. And as a married man... The will of the Lord for my life is the woman that I'm married to. I don't even got to ask him extra questions about that. Oh, Lord, I don't feel like I'm loving her. I don't, it don't feel like it used to 10 years ago. But guess what? I know the will of the Lord is for it to be like that and even more. And so I don't have to go to God and say, is she the one still? And if you're at, am I still the one? <laughs> Am I still what you called me to be for her? Because, look, if I would focus on being the husband that God called me to be, and if Diana would focus on being the wife that God called her to be, we'd be in a better place. Not that we don't, but the problem, when I start focusing too much on the wife that God called Diana to be, and I start reading all the scriptures that I think apply to her, and I begin to try to teach her how she needs to submit, and I ain't learned to love her yet. I'm, I'm dismissing the will of the Lord for my life because I, I want to get all up in hers. Look, I've been selfish all my life, and now all of a sudden I'm trying to make it about her. I've been selfish for so long. If I'm going to be selfish, let me read, let me, let's start reading this word of God with a selfish intent. Say, so you know what? For once, I'm going to get a word from me. For once, we're going to look up my faults in this Bible. For once, I'm going to be the one feeling convicted by the word of God that he sends to me. I mean, we, we, pastors have been preaching about selfishness for a while now. And if y'all anything like me, you're still struggling with it. Well, let's struggle with it in that word. Let's read what that word has to say about Samal. I'll tell you what, it has a lot to say about me. That's why I focus my eyes on my wife. Because I, I know what will distract me if I, if I don't get out of the will of the Lord. Some of us about our babes, but some of us have been messing up for a long time. Some of us know, hey, as long as, as long as she's wearing yellow, I'm fine. But as soon as she put on red, I'm in trouble. Some of us know that about ourselves. I don't, hey, as long as it's broccoli on that plate, I'm good. But let some fried chicken hit that plate. Let it be. Some of us, some of us struggle. Some of us, when we saw this thing about weed being, being legalized, if you're like me, you're like, I ain't never struggled with that. No way. What I struggle with being legal for a long time.
And then some folks, when they saw legal, I was like, oh, oh, Lord, here we go. It's going to be every, I can smell it around the corner, folks smoking it all the time. We all have, we have our struggles, right? But one answer, and that's him. So I'm going to read through my notes. We have Nehemiah in the story from last week, Nehemiah, and then Ezra, the prophet, and then the Levites. And so Nehemiah was the governor. He was the ruler, the leader, right? Ezra, he was priest and scribe. Ezra, high priest and scribe. And then the Levites, the people of God. But somehow the law was still not enough on its own. We needed a new governor. We needed another high priest. We needed another scribe. And we needed a new generation of Levites. And so now the governor in this story, Nehemiah, has become the King Jesus. The, the, the priest, even the high priest in, in this story, has become our now eternal high priest, Jesus Christ. Even the scribe that Ezra word, has, the scribe that Ezra was has now become the word of God itself. Still Jesus. And then the Levites are now those of us who are filled with the spirit of Jesus. Us the workers, the preachers, the ushers, those who serve the body of Christ, the Levites. We have now have a new generation under a new law. It says in Romans, the 10th chapter, the fourth verse, for Christ, and I'm moving fast here, so write down the scripture and catch it when you get home. For Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. As a result, all who believe in him are made right with God. We're looking to do what the law says we can do or should do. But through belief in him, being in the will of God, we are made right with him. And we confuse the purpose of the law because we we see Jesus as a way for us to accomplish the law. The law was always meant as a way for us to get to Jesus, for us to get to God. The purpose of the law is not the law itself. The purpose of the law is points us and takes us to him and so as long as there is law for a law's sake every time a new law come we get turned around whether it's you join a church and they say well it's okay if you drink as long as you don't get drunk and I'm under I, I like this law because it's about the law but when it's about him I realize look I have never struggled with alcoholism but you know why because everybody in my family struggled with alcoholism And God showed that to me, and I had a choice to make. That's a road I can go down, or it's a road I cannot go down. And that is the will of the Lord for Samal's life, that I would not be an alcoholic. Some of you, look, some of you might struggle. I had my pastor. She struggled with long hoop earrings. She just had this thing about adorning herself, and she would tell us, I can't wear those earrings. But I'm careful not to tell you that you can't wear them because that's my issue. That's what God spoke to me. Go to the Lord for a word for you. And when you get it, that, this particular word, be selfish with it. When, when God says you shouldn't be drinking, don't, don't throw it at everybody else immediately. Just hear it for you. When he says lay down the, no, the, the pornography, lay down the lust, take that, start with you. Because maybe if I could conquer what God told me to conquer, then I know how to be a conqueror. See, I can tell you to stop smoking because I don't struggle with smoking. But when I stop struggling with struggling, then I can help somebody. Because we all struggle with something. But here, here's the reality of it. We all stop struggling sometimes. We struggle for a little while, but then we give up and we go back in. God has called. uh, Look, we sang the song all those years. I'm coming up the rough side of the mountain. But but then when the rough side of the mountain hit us in in, in our sin, we won't go up the rough side of the mountain. We take the easy way out. And God's saying, you know, he he can move the mountain for us. But we kind of like the mountain a little bit. Because there is safety we perceive in the mountain. Because as long as I have a plan B for my marriage, I don't have to be vulnerable with my wife. 
I have to show her the side that if I'm not careful, she could break me. I don't have to be that vulnerable in front of her as long as I have a plan B. As long as I let my mouth and my tongue run the show, if somebody crossed me the wrong way, I got something to say. I can defend myself. I feel defenseless without my tongue. I feel defenseless without my profanity and curse words. There's safety somehow I have perceived in my filthy tongue. We have found a safety in sin. And look, and now we are looking for sin to free us from our issues. When sin is the thing we need to be freed from. And it has come to deceive us and to convince us that it can be a, a, a sort of comfort for us. When it itself has been the enemy all along. When it itself has been death itself all along. We all watch movies, so you can all think of at least one where she thought she was in love with the hero, but he turned out to be the major villain. And we have formed a relationship with it. A relationship to where I love my wife, I'm with my wife, but it, it, when something happens, I'm going to go to my wife first. Baby, this happened, this happened. And she's probably going to say something like, well, the joy of the Lord is your strength. You can make it through it. But I ain't spiritual right now, so my flesh ain't hearing that. But here I am now in a place I want to hear something different. I haven't just rejected my wife. I've now rejected the word of the Lord for my situation, the will of the Lord for my very situation. And so what I have to do is say, you know what? I'm going to struggle right now. I know if I talk to my wife about this thing, she's going to jack me up. She's my jack-up partner. She's going to jack me up. That's what God called her to do. She's going to do it. I got a decision to make, right? Am I going to get jacked up? Or am I going to go to vices? Come on. I'm going to pick a random person. Am I going to go to Deacon Petrina if she ain't my wife? And we all have things we struggle with. But the joy of the Lord inside the will of the Lord is your strength. So that means, come on now, that means that with Diana, I find strength. And, and for a lot of us, we have a wife as a jack-up partner. And for, but for those of us who are wise, we also have somebody else as a jack-up partner as well. Some of, some of us, look, if you got big, 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 big sin, you might need about three, four, five jack-up partners. They say, say, call for the elders of the church. Yeah, I'm calling all. I need all y'all numbers on speed dial this week. Because the truth is, I, I got faith against cancer. But sometimes struggle with faith against a red dress. Faith against all manner of sickness and disease. But some of us struggling with weed being legalized. Faith against HIV. Faith against all manner of sickness, but struggle with profanity and cursing in our mouth. And so we might just meet, need some elders, numbers on speed dial. Might need some jack-up partners available to us. Getting in a vulnerable place. Look, worship is a vulnerable place anyway. My hands are raised. My eyes a lot of times are closed. I'm not focused on much except the Lord. I mean, at any moment... Anyone could attack you. Anyone could push you. You could walk and trip over something. Like physically, there's a vulnerability there. And then when you get in, in a place where you're bowed down in worshiping, and if you're anything like me, you know, I'm a little bit bigger than my clothes are. Now I'm vulnerable because I don't know if my back is hanging out. Come on now. I'm already sweating through the shirt that's hidden underneath my suit, but if my suit ja jacket come off, everybody gonna see all this. Oh, look, he got a little, little, little hole around his underarm. A place of vulnerability. Look, you, we gotta be vulnerable. We have to, whatever that stubbornness is that makes us afraid, it's really fear. 
It is really fear. But that fear that says I can't talk to that person because they're going to call me out. That fear that says that I might lose my position if they know what I struggle with. That fear is sin itself and it leads to death. But the good news is that somebody's already died. The good news is that he has already died. Now, I don't have time to go into the scripture, but it said he became the high priest. Of, it refers to the order of Melchizedek. Now, here's the thing about Melchizedek. Melchizedek was actually a priest before the high priests were on the scene officially by Mosaic law. So Melchizedek was before Aaron. And if we study the high priest, the high priest had to be descendants of Aaron. Jesus was not a descendant of Aaron. So under Mosaic law, Jesus actually could not be a high priest. And so Jesus had to become a high priest under something that preceded Mosaic law. So now I'm a high priest under the order of Melchizedek because he was not only high priest, he was king. And so he is now high priest and king. And high priest and king, they would sacrifice to the high priest. They would bring their sacrifices to the high priest. But now our, our high priest has become the sacrifice. And he has become what the Bible refers to as the eternal high priest. He has now become the eternal sacrifice. And so instead of bringing sacrifices to a high priest who can't cut it himself all the time over and over and over again, now one sacrifice has been made for all sin. That sacrifice is the high priest. That sacrifice is the king. And so now Jesus is dead set center in the will of the Lord in the joy of God the Father. He has now taken joy in his son going through this, his son being declared king and high priest, king of king, lord of lords. Guess what? If he king of kings, that means this king has kings under him. Who are the kings that he king of? Are you one of the lords that he is lord of? If he's the lord of hosts, who is his army? And so now the king... Priest, the king needs some kings. The Lord needs some lords. The Lord needs some armies. And the high priest needs some Levites. The high priest now needs some people who are equipped to equip the saints. Some people who are gifted to equip the saints. Now, don't miss it, the saints. Not to equip the church folks. Jesus live outside of time, right? So that drug dealer, that drunk that's going to get saved in 10 years, God's outside of time. So when he's talking about equipping the saints, he sees 10 years from now, and he wants you to equip the drug dealer. He wants you to equip the singles with marriage relationship training. He wants you to equip to where they're going, not where they are. Because I'm already where I am. I don't need no help being who I am. I don't need no help being messed up. I don't need any extra help making mistakes. I can do bad all by myself. But there is a man of God that even five years from now is going to be here. And I need your help becoming him. There are boys and girls here that will be men and women one day. And they need your help becoming that. And as long as our sight is temporary, as long as our sight is only to my problem, my struggle right now, I can't help. I can't equip them because I don't know what they're, they're called to be. As I got to be able, we have to be able to see five years in the future. My dad tells me all the time, I said, what do you want for Father's Day? I know what you're going to say. He said, I, I just want you to kind of write out your, your plans. You know, tell me what your goals are for one year, if what five-year goals are and what your 10-year goals are. Even my earthly father saying, I want you to show me what you're going to be 10 years from now. There's a saying, I didn't make it up, but it sounds good. I'm going to repeat it. You got to see it before you see it or you're never going to see it. But look, he's already showed it to us. It's in his word. I want you to stand up right now and lift your hands up in the air. Just lift them up. 
and, and not your posture of worship, I actually want you to just lift your hands up high. Imagine that the ceiling is your blessing. The ceiling, in some sense, is always going to be your blessing. Stand on your tippy toes. Are you touching your blessing yet? But is it possible to get to it? As long as we're looking for something easy, God is always going to put the grapes just out of reach. And I can stay staring at Keith because he's taller than me and being mad at him because it's easier for him to get to the grapes than, it's easy, than it is for me. Or I can say, Keith, I need that chair. Excuse me, sir. And get to my grapes. Oh, I'm still too short. Somebody got a ladder for me. Some of us are going to jump to get to those grapes. Some of us are going to put a chair up that's going to be too small. And my kids, when they can't reach something in the cabinet, when they were young, they said, Daddy, can you get me a glass? Can you get me a cup? Now, they, I hear that noise, the, 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 um, the little step stool scraping against the, the floor because they're bringing it to where they need it. And if that's not tall enough, my son going to get a, a, a chair. And, and he's going to the, look, he gonna go to the glasses I told him not to go to. I said, son, I need you to use the cups. He said, ain't no cups clean, daddy. I'm going to get this chair and I'm going to get this glass because I need some water. I'm thirsty. Son, it's 10 o'clock at night. But the son knows how to petition the father. Daddy, I'm thirsty. I don't see no cups, so I'm going for the glasses. I can't reach the glasses. I'm getting the chair. One of the glasses broke. I'm still thirsty. I know I got an answer to that glass that broke, but I'm still thirsty, Daddy. I'm going to get whatever I need to get, however I need to get it. And somewhere, we transition from the little kid climbing on top of everything to get the cookies out of the cookie jar to the adult who's afraid just to reach a little higher because we might not get it. Let's be who God called us to be. Let's be in the will of the Father. Let's reach for what God has for you. And let's not be afraid that someone's going to see something that they shouldn't see. Because you know what? If you got to see me for me to become who God has called me to be, then you know what? You're going to have to see me. I wasn't afraid of you seeing me last week when you got on my nerves. Let's be vulnerable with those that God has called us to be vulnerable with. I'm not encouraging you to be vulnerable with everyone, but God has placed elders in this church. God has placed pastors in this church, ministers, songstresses, minstrels, ministers of all kinds of gifts in this church. We are not lacking in this church. Fivefold ministry is here. The fullness, the full breadth of ministry is here. And I'm not saying that because it's my church. I'm just saying it because it's true. What I need, I have access to, even right here. And so get access to it. Some of us, we learned yesterday, men, we need a jack-up partner. All of us were excited to hear that word. But it's a day later and not all of us have accountability partners. Because we heard that word before and we were excited about it for two weeks. But then we needed accountability, and certain, somehow the accountability partner didn't seem a, as interesting. So the last thing I'm going to say to you before I walk off this stage is take the word that is preached and keep it. And for a moment, just be selfish with it. For a moment, just eat it up. For a moment, find yourself in it. If anything was said this Sunday, last Sunday, go to the, we on Facebook now. You can go back and see what was preached three weeks ago and grab it. I'm going to do something and I challenge, at least I challenge somebody to do it. Find a scripture, a good word. I'm probably going to pick one that Pastor D, that Pastor D said, get yourself a little 20 second snippet and clip it somehow. Save it on your phone as your alarm clock. And wake up in the morning with Pastor D screaming at you. That thing. Look, look, look. That thing that sounded good on Sunday, but was hard to swallow on Monday. If you can't find a song, not just your happy song. I'm talking about that song that gets to you. That song that finds you in your sinful place. The one that's going to take you to the new you. 
the one that's going to find you in the will of God. For some of us, it's I Surrender All. For some of us, it's one of those Lecrae songs. Hey, if that's what's going to get you to where you got to go, then go where you got to go. Amen. God, I thank you for your.